Pleasure to be here with Kian. Um, as usual, we'll start off with an acknowledgement of country as well, if I can work out how to go to the next slide. Um, there we go. So I just want to acknowledge the traditional owners and their custodianship of the land on which we produce our work, the land of the Yugara and the Turrbal people. We pay our respects to our ancestors, past, present, and future, who continue cultural and spiritual connections to country. We acknowledge their valuable contributions to Australian and global society. I also recognize that I'm not producing this work as a single independent author. I'm drawing on the knowledge, experiences, and wisdom of my elders, family, and community. I'm privileged to have the opportunity to gain formal education and produce this work under the promise of continuing commitment to community, culture, and country. Thanks, Keely. All right, so a little bit about us, just so you know who we are before we blab on for 30 minutes. My name's Keely. I use she, her pronouns, and I have family connections to the Yugara people. I've got an undergraduate degree in science, and at the moment I'm working on a master's of public health and a diploma of Oslo, in hopes of becoming a doctor one day. So a forever student. And my name's Keen Wheeler. So I'm an Ingarable man from northern New South Wales, but I grew up on Ngunnawal country uh, in Canberra. Um, and yeah, just really happy to, to share this, this important project with you today. All right, so we're going to just start off with a little bit about the importance of reflexivity in research. So it's really reflection that's applied professionally and on your practice. So it's not just the mental event and it needs to be invested in action. And Dr. Martin Nakada, a Torres Strait Islander man and a renowned researcher and academic, defined Indigenous standpoint theory, which is our third point here, as a method of inquiry, a process for making more intelligible the corpus of objectified knowledge about us as it emerges and organizes understanding of our lived realities. Now, I interpret this pretty simply. It's that our natural and built worlds influence and determine the way we think and act, what we value and what we're passionate about. This thinking has links to Aboriginal ways of knowing, being, and doing. It also means our ways of knowing, being, and doing influence our research and influences the ways in which we conduct and present research. And so I think it's important to start with our own standpoints, quite briefly, given our 20 minute time limit. I'm a cisgender Yugra woman and was born on Inungai land in central West Queensland to my mother and father, who are of Aboriginal Chinese and Irish English descent, respectively currently live on the land of the Yugra and Turrbal people in North Brisbane, in a house owned by my parents. As such, I have immense privilege and guaranteed financial and housing security. This part of my identity, like all others, has shaped the way I view and interact with the world. As a direct result of colonial settler activity in Australia during the 20th century, my Aboriginal Chinese grandfather was removed from his family and relocated to a reserve. The trauma he endured alongside the physical removal led to prolific loss of connection to culture, community and country. He married a white woman of Irish descent and had two children who both married white men. As such, I have very light skin and pass as a non-Indigenous Australian, but I still long for what our family has lost. To gain closer connection with my culture, community and country, I study and work in Indigenous-led or focused spaces where possible and will continue to do this while I study public health. And in terms of where I'm coming from, so my family uh, from northern New South Wales, as I mentioned, and there's there was two uh, brothers uh, in our family, and one of our brothers moved to uh, Logan in Brisbane and uh, lived a, a very proud Aboriginal life. The other brother, uh, where which is the the side of the family that that um, I come from. Uh, moved to Sydney and pretended to be Spanish um, and uh, as a result uh, sort of worked worked into a more of a non-Indigenous non uh, uh, framework um, uh, with non-Indigenous partners and, and things like that and basically that led to again our, our light skin as Keely mentioned but what that presents to us is uh, leveraging off insider outsider theory is that we present as both an insider within the Aboriginal community, but on some levels also an outsider because of our skin colour, um, but also the fact that uh, we do exist in a pretty high profile non-Indigenous organisation 
um, but we are working in uh, First Nations health to, to, to advance uh, excellence there. Gilly? Yeah, thank you, Kim. Um, and just some terminology. So throughout this discussion, we're going to try and use the term First Nations. This is also in place of Indigenous Australians or Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, but we opt for First Nations because it recognises that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people were the first peoples of this land. We've been here since time immemorial with fossil records indicating presence to at least 60,000 years ago. Um, and as for yarning, given the structure of a conference, there's some things we need to have, like a PowerPoint and a 25 minute time limit. So um, it's not traditional yarning, but at its core, our presentation is a yarn. We're harmoni harmoniously communicating and we're sharing our work from the past six months with equal voices. Um, and some people think yarning means knitting or crocheting, crocheting and at UQ I've had a few yarning circles where people have brought their wool but this is just a chat no knitting required <laughs> and as for our partnership it began with a UQ event called Carpe Futurum which is Latin for seize the future um, so this started earlier this year and we had researchers so senior staff members submit their projects and a student panel which I was fortunate enough to sit on chose which projects aligned with the interests mentioned at this Carpe Futurum event. So we were matching up the interests of youth with the cap capacity and availability of the researchers. So the process kind of went as a full-time block in the winter break and then one day per week throughout the semester. So we're nearing the end of it now. And I'm over you, Ken. Yeah, so, so mm -hmm. the, the project that I actually submitted to the program was based around moving with culture. And moving with culture is geared towards co-designing a movement-based based program that promotes social emotional well-being. And what we aim to do is embed Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander ways of knowing, being and doing within the program in order to promote cultural reflectiveness and to give the program greater reach within a First Nations community. The community that we're piloting with at the moment is uh, Yarraba in Northern Queensland um, and a uh, beautiful community. Um, and I guess one of the, the things that we found immediately was that, that Keely, when she applied for it, uh, obviously getting her to Yarraba was quite tricky uh, over and over again for multiple visits. So we had to pivot a little bit on the project and we decided that we would gear the project towards not only uh, the co-design but establishing co-design methodology within a First Nations community um, and because that was the essential component to this, act to, to this project and so what we wanted to do was focus on the co-design and how best to do it so that we could co-design better in the future and get a really good take on what was out there in terms of the research around co-design. Keely? Yeah, so when this role was kind of advertised, it was things about quantitative and qualitative research, but in the context of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander health. And that's what really drew me in. Um, it was part of the opportunity to give back to community while also gaining valuable skills and building on my past experiences. I see opportunities like these as an opportunity to connect with culture and community, even if not directly with the Yugara people. While distinct cultural groups, First Nations Australians have a shared lived experience in surrounding myself with these people, just like Kian, in work and education environments increases the likelihood of it being a culturally safe environment where we can all thrive. So we might jump into a bit of our project now. Still haven't got a hang of flicking through the slides, uh, but we kind of started off by defining and looking into the practices of co-design. And there are a few different toolkits and guides that came up across co-design, but also ethical research, because the way you interact with First Nations people needs to be um, well thought through and it needs to put them at the center. So experience-based co-design toolkit brings together existing evidence and resources from the United Kingdom and New Zealand. It has used some Australian case studies for relevancy with various definitions throughout. Some of them are really relevant and others not so much. For one, there was one definition that was voluntary or involuntary in involvement of users, but for First Nations stakeholders, 
we really don't want to be looking at involuntary involvement. The decades First Nations people were researched on, not with or by. So that's something we're definitely shifting away from. The AAPSIS ethical guidelines for research with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. It's not explicitly co-designed, but it's critical that any research with and by First Nations is ethical. So this informs our co-design indirectly and it's central to our research and the formulation of our co-design framework, which we'll loop back to soon. The final guide is an approach to co-producing, so co-designing um, in research projects specifically. So it has key features of sharing power, including all perspectives and respecting and valuing the knowledge of people working in the team. There's also building and maintaining relationships as well as recipro reciprocity. I can never say that. Reciprocity, Kelly. Thank you. You got it. <laughs> um, so yeah, now that we have a strong theoretical background, we could just move into the co-design research, but there was actually a nuanced issue of knowing what was authentic and actual co-design versus what is just research with or even on First Nations people with co-design used as merely a buzzword. And so our project was born, still can't click, and it was effective co-design of health research in partnership with First Nations communities, a systematic review to assess key methods and processes. To promote the reflexivity of the current research, three authors on our team are Aboriginal researchers with backgrounds in community engagement, co-design and Indigenous research methodology. The fourth author has an editing role and was involved to leverage their expertise in publishing. Before beginning this study, we were confirming that there were no recent systematic reviews and we worked on some search terms, including co-design at First Nations and variations of the latter, such as Indigenous, Aboriginal, Torres Strait Islander, et cetera, as I mentioned earlier. Kian and I then independently assessed the studies against a four, four criteria rubric, which was based on the key features of co-design as they applied for First Nations partnership. These features were based on the three pre-existing ethical research and co-design frameworks I just touched on, and each study was reviewed and then graded zero to three for each of the criteria for a total max score of 12. We then re-reviewed the top three articles for Kate as a case study, and this process was conducted through a strengths-based lens, as is recommended approach among contemporary First Nations health literature. So our four coded rubric is First Nation self-determination, First Nations leadership and data sovereignty, and impact and value for First Nations communities and sustainability and accountability through First Nations governance. So we'll just work through some of these. So the first one is First Nations self-determination. So really it's about giving Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people the tools and resources they need to be as strong as they can in their own ways of knowing, being and doing. So it's things like informed consent, making sure the partnerships are meaningful and equitable and authentic. There's also a key emphasis on cultural safety, responsiveness and learning. Um, so at the center of this, I would say it's respect. Would you agree, Kia? Definitely. And, and the, the word reciprocity comes up again in self-determination, <laughs> but also in empowering individuals and communities to, to take hold of the research and really promote the research themselves. Uh, one of the key principles, of course, of co-design is that it's, it's not about the researcher owning the space. It's, it's about the researcher promoting ownership of the research by the, by the participants themselves. And in that process, the participant becomes a co-researcher and uh, should be recognised throughout in that way. And those were some of the things that we really looked for in, in the research articles. And I, I really like the acknowledgement of, of power differentials in this, because if we start to elevate participants to co-researchers in, in their own research, then you promote self-determination and you, and you break down that power differential. And I'm glad you said that. R word that I can't pronounce because that is definitely <laughs> central to it. Our next criterion was First Nations leadership and data sovereignty. And it is about, as the title suggests, leading by First Nations people in research spaces. So this is the research with and by rather than on. So in our partnership, we are, as, as I said, three Aboriginal researchers. So this is a prime example of First Nations leadership. Um, it's also about 
making sure that people who are non-Indigenous or in positions of power are relinquishing power and accepting <laughs> reciprocity. I'll get it. Of experience and expertise. Um, so this is really about the power dynamic. Yeah, and one of the, one of the things, Gilly, at the moment, isn't it? There's there's a real strong emphasis on data sovereignty at the moment, and who owns the data and where it's going and what's happening with it. So obviously, in the articles that we've reviewed, we we really wanted to look for the emphasis on um, the participants or the co-researchers owning their own data and being able to to navigate that space with their own data in hand. Yeah, which links back into self-determination. So they're all very um, closely related and interrelated. So it was difficult to split into four, but we've um, done a good effort. So the next criteria is about impact and value, which is outlined in these five points. So really it's just making sure the research is benefiting the community that it's happening with. Um, it's also about the strength that partnership can promote and contribute to impact and value. And you'll notice, Gilly, that many of these sort of assessment criteria relate very closely to the IATSIS uh, guidelines. And what we thought is in, instead of uh, reworking them or re-identifying re them or redefining them, is that instead we would work with what was out there in terms of ethical research, we would combine it with some of the co-design research of good examples and at the end of the day, we should come up with some sort of best practice for co-design. So it's only slightly nuanced the IATSIS guidelines, but I think with a with a flavor of co-design run through the, the guidelines, the ethical guidelines, that you can actually start to see some, some, some veins of, of uh, um, authenticity and, and co-design coming through the research, don't you think, Gilly? Yeah, no, it is definitely a, um, mixture of all three and others. So it's um, definitely not brand new, but it is nuanced. The last criteria, and I'll just bounce on it quickly for the interest of time, is sustainability and accountability. So it's things like recognizing the holistic nature of health in First Nations culture and making sure the governance is strong with ongoing reporting and dialogue. It's also things simple like ground rules, but most of these features we'll talk through when we're talking about our partnership. So on to our results, we had across five databases, 492 records identified, which was a terrifying number for me who I'd, I'd never done a systematic review before, but it was quite manageable by the time we got down to the inclusion. So we ended up with 15 studies um, and they were assessed for eligibility and then included in the review. So this is our Prisma flowchart, which I think is quite satisfying but <laughs> onto more important things. Um, we've then ranked the articles by their grades for each of the four criterion for a max total score of 12. And then that quantitative data was translated into qualitative data. And as you can see in the right-hand column, it's studies of low, moderate and high quality. Um, and there was quite a diverse mix, seven were high quality, four moderate and four low. So then in our discussion of our article, we chose the top score methodology. So all scores of 12 um, to have as a case study analysis. These studies are shining examples of how to work with and for First Nations communities. Now we could go through our analyses of all of these with you now, but this wouldn't leave much of a surprise for our article. Moreover, the key features of these co-design methodologies are reflected in our partnership. That is the partnership between Key and I on the project. And given the topic of this conference, reimagining student possibility and responsibility, we thought that analysis of our partnership, of the possibility and responsibility I have in this project as a student would be more effective. All right, so onto our first category, which was a criterion. It's First Nations self-determination. So for us, things like yarning, it's a preferred method of communication. Everything's really casual and informal while still getting the things done. So we didn't have an agenda set. We knew the kind of things we want to talk about. Um, and obviously our voices are central and voluntary. I was um, not just informed in voluntary consent, but I was very excited to be a part of the project. Uh, and we're learning from each other, attributing value to our lived experiences. There's also the mutual respect and joint decision-making processes and relationships are built on trust and maintained. 
We've also employed a horizontal partnership while acknowledging there's still going to be power differentials because of the position of power a staff member has over a student. And then we have leadership and data sovereignty. So as I've said before, we're First Nations authors and our other authors are First Nations or the fourth author has an editing role to leverage their expertise. There's also the joint ownership of decisions. And I was encouraged really early on to make final decisions, which was quite refreshing. Um, Keen was very respectful and responsive to the skills and attributes I brought to the team, which emphasizes the trust that's needed in a relationship with First Nations people and communities. Keen also relinquished power and I was put as the first, first author, which was pretty exciting. And I, as I said, am able to make final decisions and redirect the research as interested. We also had a flexible working arrangement to suit both our needs and responsibilities. For both of us, time for family and selves was and still is important. So this was something we favored. Uh, impact and value. So normally the research would be for the community, but in a partnership, I wanted to have a look at it in the, in the sense of what I gained. So I have had enhanced research skills experience writing and publishing systematic reviews and access to great other opportunities. So I've gone on to work in I think three different projects with Kian now and they're still in the running. That's very exciting. We've also had frequent meetings to catch up and check in with ongoing dialogue and transparency. So that's about measuring the impact and value. And we've also been reporting experiences to the UQ research forum and events through written statements and experience, etc. So this is making sure that the funding that UQ is giving us to work is actually producing impact and value. And for any research with First Nations communities, it's critical that you are measuring the impact and value because it's easy enough to say you're achieving things, but to really show it is another. I'll just jump to the next one quickly. Um, and this last one is about sustainability. So the relationships are grounded in trust and shared responsibility and that word that I can't pronounce and the ground rules and roles are established. So I think the sustainability is well demonstrated in the fact that we've gone on to do three other projects, even though it's such a short time frame, and it's a place where we can both enhance our skills and learn from each other, which is central to true co-design. And, and Keely, I'd also like to say that you, you have, as you alluded to, gone on for more paid employment, not just in uh, my research area, but in other research areas with similar mm -hmm. skill sets. So I think it's led to further employment opportunities for Keely and an opportunity to see her career progress not just as a student, but as a as an academic or as a researcher or within whichever capacity. But I think one of the great things for, for Keely is um, uh, we both set high expectations of each other. And so Keely was expecting me to bring my best game and I was expecting Keely to bring her best game as well. And from my point of view, she did that and she engaged fully and, and released herself to the opportunities and that early pivot in the project that was required. And then just to finish off, because we're running on late, our take home messages are the importance of reflexivity in research. So that's a standpoint theory and the insider outsider theory. So where you stand in relation to your work and how that influences and determines the way you work. Obviously the power of student voices in determining and influencing research in tertiary settings. And the fact that we should be including and centering First Nations voices. It's research for and by, not on First Nations. And finally, our point is that effective co-design leads to optimal outcomes for all involved. With Keen and I, there was a student and staff partnership, but co-design is effective with researchers and community and is something we should all be looking towards. And that comes to the conclusion. So thank you everyone for listening in. And if anyone thank has you. any Thanks, Keely. questions, thank you. Thank you so much to you both. Does anyone have a question for Keen and Keely? Really quickly, I just was wondering if you were able or in a position to, I guess, give um, advice to somebody who hasn't approached this area before, what would you kind of say to somebody who was about to embark on a partnership like this? And, you know, do you have any sort of messages, I guess, for like scalability, even, you know, like bringing more students in or, um, you know, growing it as a practice? 
yeah. Would you like me to talk on that, Gilly? Yeah, sure. So from my perspective, obviously, um, I, I saw it initially as an opportunity to get a, a young Aboriginal uh, candidate involved in some research and provide some upskilling. I'd had a bit of experience. Uh, I, I like it, liken it very similar to maybe an honours project or something like that, and understanding that the, the level of uh, research is is going to be at about an honours level if you if you can get the right person. So that's how I built the framework around it from my previous supervision experience in honours. But what I've quickly found with Keely is her capacity to do research is far beyond what an honours student is capable of. And so for me, much of the time, I felt like I was holding her back um, and, and she was just brilliant. But how I would approach this is really trying to capture the imagination. So for example, we, we are definitely planning on taking Healy to Yarraba just so that she can meet community and see the community co-design in action. And I think that's a big, big plus for the program is being able to provide not just a Zoom experience, but something that is tangible. That, that's from my perspective.